You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian by New Channel TV. Hi, I'm Maram Namazi. And I'm Fadi Borspuya. In this week's program, we'll be celebrating uh, Persian New, New Year or Nowruz. Happy Nowruz to Happy everybody. Nose. We're drinking wine to your health. Yes. You're, are you going to have fun tonight, huh? Yeah. Okay. Uh, during the course of the uh, um, tonight's program, we'll be um, showing you some of the clips, uh, discussion we've had with um, a few people. Uh, we've asked them what's been their best moment in the last mm -hmm. year, and we'll tell you about our best moment. In uh, the shocking news of the week, we've got a Quran teacher in Turkey telling unveiled students of 13 years old that they deserve to be raped because they're not veiled. In Insane Fatwa of the Week, it's from our very own Mr. Khamenei and his new proposal to make women in Iran baby-making machines. And the good news of the week is that Swedish government has tore up the arms deal uh, contract with Saudi Arabia because of its human rights and the case of Raif Badawi. So this Finally. is great news for everybody. Stay with us. The Persian New Year called Nowruz marks the first day of spring. It's partly rooted in the Zoroastrian tradition, but it's an ancient holiday that was celebrated thousands of years ago. When the Islamic regime of Iran first took power, it tried to ban the pagan celebration, but couldn't stop it. The advent of another year is a good time to reflect on the past and renew hopes for a future that will see positive changes in Iran, beginning with an end to the Islamic regime and its brutality. So we were talking about, since this new year, we thought we would talk about all the lovely things that have happened to us and to other people. We've been interviewing a couple of people, which we'll show you later on. And so it's good just to have some good news instead of all the insane fatwas and, you know, shocking news. We're going to have that anyhow. We, we have to have that, <laughs> yeah. But um, So basically for me personally, I would say that the best thing that happened to me this past year was the fact that we had bread and roses. I think that was great. I think that was good. One of the key moments, and I think it was important, uh, was also the conference, the October Conference, International Conference, that brought many um, secularists and atheists and progressive people together to um, take a stock of the uh, secularist sort of situation. I thought that was a great moment for me. Yeah, personally. I mean, and also I think politically for me, um, it's just a lot of all the protests that took place. I mean, in a sense, you see in this past year, Sakina Mohammad Yashiani that we've campaigned on for so many years, who was facing death by stoning, was released. I know it's just one person, but she represents so many people who are facing these unjust laws. Sure. And the fact that she can actually be reunited with her family now is a wonderful Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. And I think millions of people... Um, took part in that protest and I think that's really a good moment for everybody and in, I'm, I'm not sure if that actually the news was why so you know it was very well publicized but the fact that she's been released into the family is, is great news yeah yeah and I mean what some of the other things were just the, the protests you know the whole unveiling movement in Iran the protests against um, acid attacks there yeah. the sort of the biggest protest in human recent history you know against the muslim brotherhood in egypt yeah. you know all of that is sort of it does make you feel like you can always have hope irrespective what, what about in britain we've had a few um, successes yeah, in britain definitely well. yeah definitely in yeah britain. you've had the um, law society <laughs> yep i mean in fact backing off in in fact it's it's uh, interesting because what, some of the people that we've asked to tell us about uh, what were their best parts of the week was in fact Pragna Patel from Southall Black Sisters who talks about the Law Society victory. We've got Chris Moose talking about the victory against gender segregation at universities and Gita Sarkal talks about finally getting vindicated um, you know with her um, you know um, discussion with Amnesty International over them being a jihadi pro-Al-Qaeda organization. So let's go and look at some of the things other people have said and we'll come back to discuss it further.
the best thing is that happened to us last year, I think, is we um, started a huge campaign against uh, gender segregation UK universities um, where uh, religious societies were segregating men and women by gender and the uh, Universities UK um, public body had issued a guidance that saying that imposition forcing people to have gender segregated um, public events would be um, legal. Um, so we launched a campaign against that and um, forced uh, the Universities UK after um, getting a lot of support from various political parties um, to withdraw the guidance. And um, then in July of last year, the EHRC, the Equalities and Human Rights Commission, finally issued a guideline um, saying that very clearly within UK law, um, gender segregation is discrimination. And now we can take that forward to uh, monitor universities and see if they're really implementing that. Fantastic, thank you. You're welcome. The best thing that happened uh, this last year is uh, we see the atheist movement in the Islamic countries, especially the Middle East and North Africa, are going bigger and they got more media coverage and more campaigns, especially uh, defying campaigns to defy the fasting laws all over from Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, to Qatar and Saudi Arabia. And it was one of the biggest campaigns till now. And it made me really happy and proud that more and more people take the risk of their lives, of their jobs, of everything, just to be open about their ideas and to say that we're different and uh, we stand for universal human rights and democracy. من ابتدا میخوام رسیدن بهار و سال نو رو به بینندگانتون تبریک بگم و آرزوی این داشته باشم که زندگیشون مثل طبیعت زیبا و زیباتر بشه. سال گذشته برای من در عین حالی که سال خبرای بدی داشتیم، در عین حال خبرای خوبی داشتیم. بعد نسل جدیدی که تجربیات ما رو نداشت، بعد از انقلاب به دنیا اومد ولی این از همچنان مثل ما گفت جمهوری اسلامی رو قبول نداره و امسال اوج این اعتراضات بود از هر زاویه میبینیم گفتن که نه خودشونو به جمهوری اسلامی گفتن و از جمله میخوام اینجا سال گذشته این اتفاقی که برای ما افته برای ما همه دردناک بود میخوام از ریحان جباری یادی بکنم ریحانه با یه جمله میتونست مرگشون زندگی به زندگی برگرده ولی ریحانه جلو اینا ایستاد و قبول نکرد میخوام یادشو اینجا گرامی بدارم و به شلی پاک روان بگم ما همه همراه اون یاد ریحانه رو در سال جدید گرامی میداریم Well first of all I want to say happy Nowruz Nowruz Mubarak because it's actually our festival as well it's a Kashmiri festival it's a Parsi festival in India so you know it's part of my tradition too and uh, the best thing that happened was that Gage, which is uh, a group of ex-Guantanamo detainees, who are actually a jihadi front organization, a pro-Al-Qaeda organization, their public relations in Britain in a way, uh, they were exposed thoroughly. Now, they've been exposed to us for a very long time, but they gave a press conference saying Jihadi John was a sweet and gentle individual and bought posh baklava. <laughs> so actually, we had some posh baklava today mm -hmm. to celebrate the fact that they thoroughly exposed themselves. They showed that they can't even condemn stoning, punishments and things like that because they're not a th theologians. Mm -hmm. And they came out actually defending many aspects of terrible ISIS regimes, Daesh re you know, the Daesh regime, and Al-Qaeda. And um, Amnesty International was embarrassed yet again in their relationship with them. But this scandal is actually still unfolding. So there'll be more good news coming. Great, thank you. I think that I'm a good year. I had a good year, I had a good year. For example, we worked in the committee of the Hedam, we worked in the radio خوب بود خبرای خوب بود خبرای بد بود و در این حال پیوستنمون شد قبلتر از اون پیوستنمون به حزب کنسکارگری خبر خوبی بود اتفاقی که تو سال گذشته برای خود من و رفقایی که با هم اومدیم و نهایتا هم این اواخری که در نزدیک میشیم به سال جدید خبر بچه دار شدن من و نوشین شد یکی از خبر خیلی خوب دیگه امسال تبریک از خیلی ممنون در ضمن نوروزم تبریک میگم به همه وندان که سال خوبی باشه هاپی نیو it's been a great year, actually. Just when you think it's not possible, the possible happens. Who would have thought that the fight against fundamentalism could be so easy? Uh, 
We've had some great victories, um, but I guess the one that took us by surprise most was the fact that the Law Society, which had issued guidance um, it, to promote Sharia compliance amongst the legal profession, uh, which we opposed on the basis that it um, promoted actually gender segregate uh, gender discrimination uh, was withdrawn um, in 2014 and that was followed by a public apology by the law society saying that they'd got it wrong that was great because we weren't expecting um, the law society to withdraw so quickly its guidance on um, Sharia compliance in relation to drawing up wills um, and we certainly weren't expecting an apology so that was um, really welcome. I think they were thoroughly embarrassed because as a institution of law they should be promoting a rights-based legal culture and instead they were promoting a very discriminatory misogynistic, homophobic um, culture. And so um, it was, it was um, great to see them squirm as much as they did and to issue a public apology to us. I think that's really, really given us a lot of confidence because it's made us feel that, you know, when the tide seems to be really against us, it is possible to just put your foot in and sometimes just swim against the tide. I hope you enjoyed uh, those short segments from different people. We asked them what was the best part of the past year. I mean, Imad Habibadin, who is the founder of the Council of Ex-Muslims, uh, he, he said that it was the rise of atheism in the Middle East and North Africa and the fact that last year, this past year, they had the biggest fast-breaking picnics ever that had happened before and that it happened in many different countries where people who are forced to fast because it's the law in those countries say we're not going to fast we don't want to fast and they break the fast they might face arrest they were attacked in Morocco I know some of the activists were beaten but nonetheless they did that and I think it's a huge success for all of us as are many of the protests that we discussed let's now go and talk about um, the shocking news of the week In shocking news of the week, we've got news that in Turkey, a Quran teacher, who's a woman, by the way, was trying to quiet down her class. It's a mixed class of boys and girls. And she basically told the girls, 13-year-old girls, that because they're unveiled, they deserve to be raped. That's shocking. This is un un unbelievable. I mean, that's the sort of rubbish that religious in all re religious schools the pedal these are the sort of things they keep day in day out to tell um, they tell children but the difference is that now parents have come out exactly. and they want the teacher sacked rightly so and I think that's a really just demand for the teacher not only be sacked I think they should close down religious schools well the thing is that this is actually part of now schools in Turkey since 2012 because of Erdogan and his Islamicization of Turkey. I mean, what a setback for secularism. They've got voluntary elective Quran schools now. So children can elect to go to them or their parents can elect yeah. them to go to them. And then later on they make it compulsory. That's, yeah. that's the Well, step they've to made take. religious education compulsory. That's what they do. I think that, that's a step-by-step sort of thing. I think since this, I think we should call it Islamist government. Definitely. In, in Turkey, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's taken uh, power, it's trying to push back all the gains of, you know, progressive gains that Turkey's had, and people are resisting. I think the fact that, the fact this is becoming news, it's not because just the teachers say that, it's because parents have demanded, Definitely. that's why it's made, it's made the news. The other uh, piece of sort of news that we heard last week was that the atheist uh, um, group in, in Turkey, the, the website now has been blocked by the by the government so the islamist government in turkey is trying to restrict freedom of expression as well as you know encouraging religious schools and religious education and i think that need we need to recognize that although the turkish society is quite progressive there's a lot of women's activists young generation they they're, they're not accepting the rule of uh, um, islam but the government is trying it's trying hard yeah and and what's interesting about the parents as well is that 
uh, you know, they were complaining about this Quran teacher, and they said that even when the young woman, you know, was uh, raped and murdered, Aslan, and there were mass protests against yes. her, this teacher had told the students not to go and protest, but instead to pray for her. Absolutely. And so again, we see the really negative role that religion can play in people's lives, and why, of course, it can be a private matter, but for goodness sakes, keep it away from children, keep it yeah. away from schools. And as soon as it comes into public space and public domain, it has a disastrous and negative impact, I agree. Yeah, I mean, and also to, to go back to the Turkish Atheist Society, I mean, they're really a group that we must support. They're affiliated with the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain, and I know them well. They're just really brave, wonderful people, and we need to hu raise a huge outcry of, of the fact that it can be banned. You know, you've got Islamist websites saying that girls can be murdered, that, you know, um, apostates can be beheaded, left, right and center. You have these sorts of websites. They're never banned. And then it's people who are, you know, promoting free thought, rationalism, saying Sec that people have a right to atheism, secularism. That's the website that gets banned. And uh, uh, we need to recognize there's a huge fight going on in Turkey. We need to pay a lot of attention and support the secularists and atheists. They're, yeah. if that, they're, they're of major force for good yeah. in Turkey. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that Turkey is an important country for us as secularists, as atheists, as free thinkers, whether we're religious or not to really look at and pay attention to and support. I mean, there are people who are fighting for very basic universal values, um, you know, whether it's in, uh, against religious education, whether, you know, it's the parents criticizing the Quran teacher, whether it's all those masses of people that came out in Rezi Park, uh, and demanded secularism, uh, or people who have started the atheist organization there. And we really have a responsibility to look at their fight as our own. I mean, we are only going to win and be str if we're stronger and if we're together. Insane Fatwa of the Week is from our very own Mr. Khamenei, who has now said that the, the regime's policy on contraceptives is an imitation of the Western lifestyle. And he wants the Iranian population to be doubled for whatever reason. I think they the want more uh, uh, sort of... Uh, people to send to war. That's what it is. But I interestingly, the whole uh, movement in Iran for, uh, you know, f for uh, vasectomy and um, uh, using con contraceptive to manage population um, and for young people who are very uh, socially active and sexually active as well, uh, contraceptive was quite a sort of uh, um, way of managing the, um, um, uh, the social life as well as the uh, um, number of children that they have. Now the Islamic regime has recognized this is a battleground and they want, to, they want to stop it. The other thing is that the, in reality the uh, explosion of population in Iran uh, has brought a, a, a level of difficulty for the Islamic regime and no sane sort of uh, um, you know, person who is planning uh, a society would just ask people without any risk double the population. You know, I think that this is just this crazy, and everybody's up up in arms against this mad, crazy man who the thing is he's going to die very soon, incidentally. Well, I mean, the thing about this is also I think it's a good example of how religion is used in politics. In the 80s, when they killed off all those people during the Iran-Iraq War, um, they wanted people to have children. In the 90s, they decided to control it and yes. their, their policy was two, no more than two children. And now it's become a Western imitation and they're trying to restrict it. And it's serious because they've actually got a bills in the Islamic Assembly because Khamenei said this, which will criminalize, you know, a lot of the things that are now permissible, yes. like vasectomies, voluntary sterilizations, and also, you know, um, distribution of condoms and so on and so forth. And basically what it's going to do is reduce women to becoming baby-making machines. Yeah, and, and, and the fatwa is, uh, you know, the make it up. As they go along, yeah. there's no, I mean, there's no rules why would Why does he want the population doubled? I mean, you know, it's because everybody hates them and they want to create more babies that are going to hate them. And I think part of it is actually to, <laughs> uh, you know, to um, effectively by this to control 
and uh, manage that confrontation mm. that exists in society. Mm. So they're, they're actually intervening at mm. that level to stop uh, the confrontation that exists between the young people and the establishment. I mean, one of the things Khamenei said is that the population in Iran is aging, which again isn't true. I mean, you've got 70% of the population under 35. Yes. Uh, you know, over 50% is between the ages of 20 to 30. And one, one uh, person was saying, one of these um, researchers was saying that in fact it's because they're not having children because they don't have the money to do anything because of the social, economic, political pressures uh, that people aren't able to get married and have children and, you know, all of that as well. Yeah, I, and, you know, no matter how much fatwa um, it, in this guy sort of issues, the reality is that young people are against this policy and uh, they'll ignore it. And uh, But it's a battleground between the young generation and the religious establishment. Yeah, but I mean, the thing is that it's going to become part of the law because most likely sure. it will be followed through. And what this will mean is that it will put a lot of pressure on women to have more children. And what, what they're doing along with this, they're bringing laws which say, Priority must be given to married uh, to men with children, then married men, and then women with children, and they're restricting even further women's right to divorce. All the things that will prevent women from not having children. So it's going to cause a lot of, you know, children that are not wanted, um, abortions, yes. um, that back street abortions. Back street abortions. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to create a huge problem. And already women in Iran, you know, have horrible situation in the sense that they're so discriminated against legally and you know from their testimony being worth half that of a man's to the fact that nine-year-olds can be considered criminally responsible and be married and so on and so forth and here we've got another sort of pressure on Iranian women so rightly I think uh, you know people are criticizing it and trying to push this back. Now, the good news of the week is that the Swedish government has actually tore up an arms deal with the Saudi Arabia. I and love this that. is such a good news. Yeah. Uh, the uh, reaction by the Saudi government, incidentally, the reason for this has been twofold. One is the human rights in Saudi Arabia, and specifically, the Swedish government is referred to the case of. Rauf Badavi, and that's such a great thing um, to hear. But, you know, usually um, governments, when they want to, sort of, they condemn it generally and they carry mm -hmm. on. They send, for example, the British government carries on sending Prince Charles across. And to sending meet more arms. And, more arms, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And the deal, and there's always businessmen behind this and said, yeah. we need to have country. Yeah. And uh, this is great news to actually have. The reaction of the Saudi government has been to withdraw its ambassador to. Yeah. Um, um, to uh, Sweden, and our reaction would be good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and the thing is that Sweden has torn up a 10 year arms deal with the regime. Yes. And seriously, that is what makes sense. If a regime like the Saudi regime, like the Iranian regime, I hope the Swedish government will focus on Iran exactly, next, yeah. uh, is cre creating, committing such you know, human rights violations. Why are you sending arms to them? It's common sense. Stop it, you know. Yeah. And also the uh, the Arab foreign ministers. Now, this is interesting. Arab foreign ministers have supported the Saudi, Su Saudi yeah. uh, government and they've stopped the speech of the uh, Swedish foreign minister. Yeah, they stopped her speech. And this is what they've said, because in, in her speech, she had said that, uh, you know, it's a medieval practice of giving a thousand flocks to Raif Badawi. And they were con they were uh, expressed condemnation and astonishment at this foreign minister's remark, which were, which were incompatible with the fact that the constitution of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is based on Sharia law. Because it's which, in the constitution, it's okay. And which guarantees human rights. I this mean, what like, sort of human rights are they talking I about? I have no idea. They're talking about Islamic human rights, most probably. Th their right to flog people. That's, that's what it is. That's not a human right. I don't think I, they I, realize I, that. It's a Saudi Arabian <laughs> rights. Yeah, it's know, like I mean, the Islamic human rights uh, sort yeah, of they, which yeah, has no, contradiction in terms. They just use the name of human by mistake in there. I think it's just <laughs> that it, that's what it is. And I think this is a great news for, uh, uh, for everybody. And I think it is one of those things that it, it's possible to actually put pressure on governments to uh, stop abusing human rights and, and undermining human rights. And I think that's what we need to do. People realize they, they, you, know, there's, you, you don't need to have sanctions. And I think that's one of the things. Economic sanctions. No yeah. economic sanctions, but yeah. political intervention yeah. is the key. 
and time and time and time again we'll see the um, particularly western governments they just condemn they express indignation that's all they do but they actually don't do anything i think there's two things also that's important about this case is one is that um, you know you've got his wife outside who's really like spearheading this amazing campaign now everybody knows who he is you know and who's who's fighting in his corner you know and it shows how important even one case is in changing the the sort of power relations and status quo. Yes. Uh, you know, we've done actually a similar letter to the British government yes. uh, that's uh, su supported by many different uh, personalities as well as some MPs and so on and you, so forth. You wrote that to David Cameron? We've written that to David Cameron. Has he responded yet? We, we, well, it's just been sent out. But okay. one of the good things about that is that with the example of Sweden, this is definitely something we should be pushing in other countries as well, from Britain to Canada, Australia, wherever. And I think we also it, can look at it as a lesson on putting pressure via specific cases on other governments that are causing these sorts of you know, horrendous human rights violations, like I'm looking at you, the Islamic regime of Iran. And I think uh, let's, see, let's hope that in, the, in this year, coming year, we'll have a lot more good news to share. Hopefully we'll see Rauf Badawi freed yes. and his right and uh, you know, restored and um, a lot more government react, governments react to abuse of human rights in the Islamic ridden societies without any shame and that's what we need to do. So uh, again we're wishing you a happy new year. Yeah, Sorry absolutely. I from, 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 from both, both of us. us. Yes, yeah, we okay. just we just want an excuse yes, to have to another have sip. More drinks. Um, tell us about your um, your views about the program. We always welcome your comments. Uh, write to us, email us, go on our Facebook and don't forget to support us financially. Yeah, we've got a Patreon um, site now where we can get uh, support from you for just even $1 a week. And we've now got 11 patrons. So thank you to all of uh, you who have supported us. We hope you enjoyed this week's program and we look forward to seeing you again next week at the same time and same place. Bye. Goodbye. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.